What's going on, everybody? Welcome to a brand new episode of Virtual Coffee House. Before we dive into the episode, I just want to say Virtual Coffee House is completely non-monetized. It's completely free. It will stay this way forever. It's a way of us giving back as part of our HPMS Ventures Foundation. We host this podcast for the sole purpose of helping musicians, right? Helping music students. This is a podcast for high-performance musicians, right? We bring on career tips. We bring on college audition advice, music school tips, anything you can think of. Entrepreneurship, music business, anything to serve musicians as much as possible. Because of that. So the only way to support us is really leaving a five-star review. And if this podcast really impacted your life, you learned something, please, if you can write us a written review, that would really help us uh, for the podcast, uh, help us with the algorithm. Um, so I just want to say, please do that if you can. That's the only thing we ask you to do. It's not monetized. If you can also share this video, share this episode, share this stream. Whichever way you're listening or watching this podcast right now, we really, really appreciate that. I also want to say we work really, really hard on publishing these episodes. It takes hours to just edit the content alone. I work very, very hard on bringing these tremendous guests on the show. They are literally the best in the music industry. And I always have a passion for serving people and making an impact on people's lives, especially those who are struggling, those who are younger than me, and those who feel so lost in their um, application process for music schools and trying to figure out what is the best way to get in the schools they want to get into to find the music career that suits them the best. Okay, so um, typically you will literally spend $200, $300 per hour just to have private lessons or conversations with these guests but i try my best to make it happen for you for free so i just hope i can impact as many people as possible another way of really helping us is to post on your own social media of what you learned from this episode using hashtag virtual coffee house using hashtag high performance musicians And if you are really, really struggling with your music applications right now, you are a high school music student, you want to go to music schools, but you feel lost, you can always send us a DM with your question. You can also check out my startup, HPMS Venture. Just Google HPMS Venture. It will take you to our startup page. We have our coaching programs. You can also schedule one-on-one consulting sessions with us. We have helped a handful of music students get accepted into their top choices, Eastman, Juilliard, schools in Europe, you name them. So if you really need help, definitely check it out. Now let's get into the content. Today we have the Seattle Symphony Orchestra, previous music conductor Ludwig Morlot, now acting as the Emeritus Conductor of the Seattle Symphony Orchestra. It's such my honor to have you here, Maestro Merlot. It's wonderful to see you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, let's start with the first question. So you were trained as a violinist in school, and then you chose to take the conductor route, which when did you start to have that mindset switched? And why did you choose to take the conductor, professional conductor route? Well, I, as, a, as a violinist, I played a lot in uh, chamber music groups and also a lot in orchestra setting. So uh, the orchestra repertoire was very important to me already as a violinist. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I suspect the, the repertoire would be my answer is really what drove me to want to, to put my head into the scores and learn more about, about the inside of, a, of an orchestral piece. And, so you know, analysis and analyzing the score, and and of course the sheer sound of the orchestra is re- was really a big attraction for me. So I, I would I would say that little by little, I got more and more opportunities to to lead ensembles from the violins, and little by little, I was offered to to try conducting, and I fell in love with it really. But it was really this curiosity of exploring the orchestra repertoire. Hmm, that's wonderful. That drove me into make it was it was well into my 20s you know not mm. nothing i was not I, I, I was not thinking about conducting for for a long time mm. 
And did you feel a special sort of magic moment when you first step on the stage? Well, I mean, no, it, it was a, a very uh, s- slow transition because I, hmm. you know, I, I, I started the first time you conduct an ensemble, you don't really know what you're doing. And it's, it's so overwhelming that the music becomes almost uh, secondary, you know, it, mm. it, it, everything becomes very self-conscious. And so it, it, it took a while for the for me as a conductor to start feeling that I could have some influence on the music. And did your conducting career start to bloom right after college? Or was there like a long transition period you have to build up step by step? Uh, I, I was very lucky that it it did go pretty quickly in the sense that uh, quick, quickly I was um, offered to study with Seiji Ozawa at the Tanglewood Music Center, mm-hmm. the Boston Symphony Summer Home. And then, uh, and then right after this, I got a, an offer to be assistant conductor with an orchestra in France. And, uh, and then I became, you know, assistant of, uh, the, at the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And then quickly I got opportunities to guest conduct at very high level. So I was very uh, fortunate in a way that once I made the choice to study conducting, things happened very quickly for me and never really had time to to think twice about it. You know, I I tried to play violin as long as I could, but the the conducting life took, took over very quickly. That's wonderful. And what and who would you say motivates you the most to become a professional musician at a young age? Well, I, I don't know if I ever thought of music as a profession more than um, mm. really wanting music to be part of my life every day. You know, wow. it, it is a little bit the same thing, but I never thought of it as a as a job. You see what I mean? I, it's always been that I, I wanted music to be part of my life. And and it, it, it happened that from one thing to the next, I was actually um, making a living with it and you know having this wonderful life making music with fantastic musicians every day so it was not I wouldn't say it was like someone or a, a specific time where I decided to be a professional musician but from the minute I played the violin as a very young boy I I knew that was very something very important to me and so so I'm I wanted this to be a big part of my life and whether amateur or, or, or professional, I, it was more important for me to actually have this wonderful company of music every day. That reminds me of something. I remember two years ago at NYO China, which I'm a very proud alumni and we're so honored to have you as our artist director. Uh, I remember you said one thing that really spoke to me was that you said, just think about how lucky we are to play music every day and make music. That really touched my heart. And just, could you emphasize more on the on taking music as a profession and to be able to play music every day and make music every day now? Isn't true? I, I, I mean, I find you see so many people that don't like their jobs, you know? <laughs> right. Uh, that, that I, indeed, I really believe we are so privileged to not only be able to, to create this world of beauty every day, because that's what we, aspiring to right always creating this world of beauty um and then to actually be able to earn a living with it and and be able to travel the world with it and meet some wonderful colleagues uh, and share emotions with audiences and and musicians i still to this day you know especially in big crises like today with the covid19 uh pandemic where we we can't have those moments make make us realize even more so how important that is and how privileged we are to to hopefully come back to to what is so precious and special for us Mm -hmm. and i I know a lot of people would say taking music career especially classical music career is extremely high demanding and difficult so as a professional conductor what would you address on this level of difficulty to take it you know to make a living out of it well, I, I read it beautifully put that the best advice I could give to anybody aspiring mm-hmm. to live with music is to forget the word career. <laughs> I, mm. I I find it's more important to think of it as a vocation. Mm. And once, because I think the career kind of gives you the wrong signals in terms of learning and ex, 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 curiosity and 
I think if you think of it as a vocation and something that you want to learn and study your whole life, then it becomes a, a much more easy way to apprehend a, a, a professional life in music, actually. When you think that if you constantly ask the how and why of everything you do in music, I think then that sense of curiosity and that sense of, of building a voice hence the the word vocation is is much more relevant for me and mm. so it it would be almost an a, a, my advice is to to forget about the career and but but really to focus on finding your voice and and believing so strongly in what you want to say with the music that you play that that it becomes your 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 voice and your way of life and and leave the career aside because the career in a way is not something that you can or want want to control, but you want to be a, mm. able to control your your expressing your emotions and sharing your 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 stories really. Wow, that's very interesting. I've never actually thought about that. And let's talk more about your career at or or your vocation at Seattle Symphony. Mm -hmm. After eight years, now you have stepped down, retired. And could you share with us some special moments, some of the most memorable moments during your time with the Seattle Symphony? Well, I mean, there's so many over eight years. Um, mm -hmm. You can only imagine when you're, you're, you're sharing so much music, they have very, very special moments. Um, I mean, one, of course, that comes to my mind right away is, is my few last concerts, final concerts with them, mm -hmm. because I think, you know, knowing that you're going to move on and you've had this very, very uh, privileged position to, to look for a voice, you know, and work on, on, on music together, you reach a point where a lot of things are, understood very naturally mm -hmm. and i think the, the the pinnacle of that really happens in the last few months because everybody wants to give 150 percent percent of of everything you know for for the for the artistic climax of course of, of that tenure but there there were some very uh, special concerts i remember doing a, a concert we called music beyond borders Mm -hmm. When uh, th th there was a, a restriction from people from the seven countries to travel to the United States, we organized very quickly, overnight almost, a concert. Musicians from those seven countries, so Syria, you know, Af Afghanistan, and and we 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 actually ask all the musicians from the symphony to to play uh, uh, for free, you know, to give their services for for that special concert. And how how things came together very quickly but also with very powerfully was very strong because it it reminded me how much everybody loved the music you see and sometimes when you when you're in a routine and you play concert after concert after concert of course we all love the music but you you somewhat focus on small things and that concert became focusing back on the much bigger message of what why we want to be musician in the first place you know um so that's that's an incredible memory. I mean, uh, musical moments, of course, tremendous numbers of musical moments. But I remember also our record recording uh, very fondly because we we worked very very hard at establishing a voice through our mm. uh, recordings. And when the orchestra was uh, celebrated as Gramophone Orchestra of the Year in 2018, it, w it was, I believe, yes. And then. Um, and then five Grammys for the orchestra through our recordings. That's right. All those moments of recognition were very important because I could see the orchestra taking a lot of uh, pride about all the work that we had accomplished and, 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 and committed to. And so those moments are very special because it creates even more bond between uh, all the musicians on stage. And that bond that you can create helps the orchestra to perform yet to the next level artistically um but many other moments you know we had a chance to to do a little uh, tour on the uh west coast of of the united states with a residency at a uh, at berkeley university that was very special moments i i guess all those moments where i could feel that the orchestra was was becoming even more of a family so on and off the stage, everything that could create that sense of community was very important. And there were many of those moments, uh, you know, a concert in a, at Carnegie Hall early on in my, into my tenure, which was very, very special for us too. And 
and many collaborations, of course. Must be so wonderful to have that privilege, I believe. And you are now actually getting more and more involved with the educational programs, you know, NYO China, which I'm a part of, mm -hmm. and Aspen, you know, summer festival, etc. So as you interact with the teenage musicians, younger musicians, instead of professionals, what are some biggest mistakes or or things that you see us make or you want to address? That's a very gorgeous question. It's a difficult question. Hmm. Uh, I would say, you know, I talked about curiosity earlier. Right. And often that's what I, I find sometimes in, in younger musicians is the lack of curiosity. Hmm. When I say this is that some sometimes as, as young musicians, I feel we are easily influenced into uh, certain tradition or of repeating or imitating one's voice. And I think if not a mistake, that's something that I would encourage young, younger musicians to explore more is the, is the, the how and why of everything that they do with their instrument, that it's not because they were told to do so, but because they really had this curiosity to look out for the answers of all those questions that they might have. Because, you know, sometimes tradition or even mentorship can be extremely powerful. Sometimes it's just a repeat of mistakes that have been done for centuries. And tradition can be sometimes dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. As you know. And the other the other thing I could see maybe as a, if I think of myself 20 years ago, you know, and what I would have maybe want to do a little differently, possibly rather than integrating a little bit of life into the music that I was making all the time is to to see the bigger picture of life is so much more than just music. And if music becomes one part, strong part of your life, then your music actually becomes stronger because it, it is so much wider in interest. You include all kind of different interests into your music making rather than focusing entirely on the music that you're creating and sometimes forgetting about everything else that is around it and that can be very beneficial to the music that you can create. So maybe maybe to realize that, I mean, music can be very important in your life, but it's better to think of music being part of your life rather than life being part of your music, if you see what I mean. It, mm -hmm. it can be so much broader if you if you involve everything that can be embraced into, into your life, mm -hmm. into your music making. So one thing I think just popped out in my head um, so a lot of us as, I think especially as Asian teenage musicians or Chinese teenage musicians in general, we, we focus so much on working on the technique and somehow becoming a soloist because we want to have the perfect technique, perfect, uh, you know, everything. How would you weight on the technique music versus musicality, which as I train in the states the teachers tend to emphasize more over the technique aspect well i, I think the two are only one actually if mm -hmm. you think about it technique should come to serve the 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 the, the, the stories that you want to tell you see um mm -hmm. i don't think technique in itself can can be justified because technique should be at the service of something bigger and uh, the, the the more refined your technique the better but I think you have to always trans translate what what your technical ability will allow you to to say musically and and how you be able to to use that technique to to have more tools in a way to really share tell your your musical stories so uh, I never think of uh, of technique and, and musicality as two different things. For mm -hmm. me, it's one and the same that constantly goes back and forth between each other. You know, you wanna you wanna do a phrase that that way. Therefore, you're gonna have to have the technique that that allows you to be able to express that. And uh, so, technique is is a is is a tool bag that you have and that you use uh, in in order to really be able to express what what you want to. It's never the other way around, you know. It's not technique in itself is nothing if it doesn't serve a bigger purpose. Hmm. I I think it's a it's a little bit like uh, 
if you compare in the sport field, if you have a wonderful technique but you don't have a strategy for the game, mm -hmm. then then your technique is of very very little use, right? And I it, That's true. it is even more telling when you when you when you relate it to expressing and sharing emotions through the music that you make. So technique is very important, but should should only be uh, apprehended as how you can use it to strengthen your musical voice or message. So uh, I see what you yes. I, I'm hearing what you're saying, because of, right. often people separate separate those two things. But exactly. for me, they're, they're, they're absolutely not separate. They're, one is serving the other and constantly back and forth between the two. I think especially for us, we, we always get, you know, my age, we always get caught up working on focusing only on techniques and then sort of forget the purpose of making music, which <laughs> it happens. So um, it can, yeah, it can be very easy to do. And that's why I think the always the, the curiosity of first of all, understanding what you want to say mm -hmm. and, and what you want your voice to be. And then the, the technique that you built will come to actually serve that, that messaging. Mm -hmm. so one of the few last things we should address here is, so as I, I believe most people watching this would be similar to my age and also my age, I'm heading into college and some of us are in college right now, music schools. What are the differences between going to a music school and then get out of school and take music professionally, work as a professional musician? Ideally, there shouldn't really be a difference. Mm. I think we should all be feeling that we are constantly studying this field of music. Um, as professional, suddenly, you know, it's not like you know everything. It, the, the journey continues that you're still having even more doubt about how this or that thing should be done. So the attitude shouldn't be very different. I think the the chance that we have as students and as younger musicians is that we actually have more time in our hands, I believe, to to really pursue that voice that we're looking for. What I'm what I'm trying to say is that once you get engaged into a professional routine, so to speak, or schedule, you realize that there's very little time for you left for your own exploration of things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's you, you know you you you're there at the rehearsal. I mean, we always think as a student that we are busy like hell. But <laughs> right. the reality is that you you become a, a professional musician and and you're busier than ever because also it's that moment in your life when you start having a family and you start uh, traveling much more and you start having bills to pay and you know all those things come to to you actually offering a little less time in your hands to to really study in depth what you want to study. So I think the attitude shouldn't change, but I would say if I'm if I'm talking today to a lot of people uh, younger and, and in that still that wonderful privilege to be in a in an environment of a school where they can learn and have all the facility and material to, to, to learn and and and, and uh, research then I would say it's it's your time to realize that you actually have a lot of time and you will never have as much time in your life ever again. And this is your chance to really do the the the, the groundwork on so many fields. You know, repertoire, you should explore repertoire, but you should also be uh, reading a lot and, and, you know, learning languages and doing all those things that take so much time and that later on in your life you You'll, you'll have to really make a special commitment to find the time again for those things. Mm -hmm. So just to realize that, I think, is a very important thing. Because uh, I, I re in retrospect, I've, I think I've, I've, I did waste a lot of time as a young uh, musician. Oh, really? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I'm sure I was feeling always overwhelmed, you know, because I had two new pieces of music to learn or something. But but then after after having been music director of a of a, a, a you know leading U.S. orchestra, I just realized how little time I had for myself to to explore and study the music. 
in those eight years when I was in Seattle. So therefore, it, it brought me back to those 20 years back when I was a student and realizing, oh, those were the days where I should have invested more time in 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 in, in learning more about this and that. And, and that's uh, maybe something that I'd like to share because it's hard to realize until it's too late mm. and, and you don't have time anymore. Better take advantage now, <laughs> my age. Of course. I mean, you never you never stop, but there's a there's a chance now as a younger musician to also, as you're actually looking for your voice as well as an artist, right. to really explore in a, a lot of different directions, which later on is is still possible, but it's much more of a challenge to create the time for it. And one last thing, let's talk about where do you see the future of classical music industry are headed into? More, I mean that. I, what I think, it's it's really difficult for the majority of the, the, the kids to approach to, to learn an instrument, to really learn and, and study the aesthetics of, of classical music. And also, I think the business aspect, because every time I go to a concert, I don't see people in my age at all, you know, most of the time. So just want to hear your opinions on it. Uh, it's a big question, Stephen. It's uh, <laughs> it's one that we are constantly battling with because, mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many different answers to that. One, I think, uh, when we we speak about the the future of of, I mean, I don't really like the the, the term classical music because that narrows right. it very much to the that that period of time, you know, at the late eighteenth century. I, I prefer to th think of the, of this as music mm -hmm. period and there's or there's orchestra music there's uh, I, I mean if you narrow it down to classical then it for me it means something very spe specific when I, I prefer to talk about instrumental music or vocal music or, or orchestra music or, uh, and think of more of genres than actually uh, a, a, a time like this. So I think the one of the answer for me is that we should be much more aggressive with music education. Most of the place, and you're one of the lucky ones in China where music is still very present in the schools and in the training and in in part of you know when you grow up you you play an instrument or you sing and I there are many many places in the world where where this is not happening anymore where there's no music education in schools anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the big first mistake because we should treat music like it's it's indeed that international language where we can all communicate with. And how beautiful that would be that everybody on this planet could speak it with fluency, you know, could speak the language of music with fluency because that would make communication between everybody in the world so much easier. Uh, as as we we are lucky because we know that by experiencing it, right? Mm. We we can play Shostakovich, Shostakovich music together. That's right. I don't speak Chinese. You don't speak French. And and yet we can we can meet somewhere, you know, with all those emotions mm -hmm. and that that universal language. So this is kind of obvious for me to say this, but it's never gonna be emphasized enough that music should be taught in schools. From the from the most tender age, and need needs to find its way back into school um, education. That's uh, that's a must. And by educating the the young people with with music, with orchestra music, with uh, this this setup, then you give yourself chances to actually also educate f uh, audiences of the future. Because if if this is a language that you speak and that you understand then you will want to go to concerts and you will want to uh, wherever you are traveling to you you will want to have that experience with the language that you that you know so well so this is one side of the story i think another side when it comes to the business side of things it's to it's also to be very open minded that music can be can be presented in very different ways in very different spaces and places it doesn't have to always to be a, 
a big 90 minute uh, concert with intermission uh, uh, it can in a in a concert hall you see mm. it can be very powerful to bring music in different contexts and different formats uh, in the you know in the street in the schools in the anywhere you 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 can make it happen and to to have music always as, as the heart, the heartbeat of everything happening around you meaning that People, wherever they are, they they have no choice but experiencing it and and living with it. And as musical leaders, that's where our responsibility lies: is that we we must create those uh, platform for people to be able to embrace uh, musical experiences like this. Um, but I think most mostly, I'm not I'm not too too worried about not seeing enough young people in the concert hall. Of course, I would love to see more young people in the concert hall, but the reality is that when you start in your life, you have to start your career, your, your career, I say, but your job, you know, I, you have to start working really, really hard for your, your first steps into your new profession. You start a family. So, so sometimes, you know, it's very challenging for people in their 20s, 30s, even 40s sometimes to go go out on a on an evening after you've worked the whole day and mm. uh, and and you have a, a family waiting for you at home and so i think it's quite natural that we t- we 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 go back to the concert hall when we are a little older and uh we have a little bit more time in our hands and less pressure from from the day to day life um but if Early on in your life, you do, you didn't have that edu- musical education. Then, when you ha- finally in, later in your life you have the time, you're not actually really encouraged to to go ex- explore it because you have zero connection with it. So that's why the the music education is very important as, you, uh, as a, at, at a very young age because you create memory about it. You you develop. Uh, a connection with that language of music and later in your life you you you'll be able to actually be inspired by that again and 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 go to to the concerts so it's more crucial for me to do the work as a young young children at school is where it, it all must start i think that's very very inspirational so maestro Marlo, thank you so much for being here today it's such my privilege to talk to you and i just want to say thank you for all your wonderful mentorship to me this year and last year i still remember the concert at berlin where the chemistry you know the the connection you mentioned it, it was still there and it was such a it would be an experience for life so thank you again for being here and it's such my honor to talk to you uh, it's an experience share that uh, I tell you, and I, I look forward to the day I can share music with you again. Thank you, Maestro Morlot, and hope to see you again Thank soon. You. Likewise. Take good care of yourself. Thank you.